let me repeat. So the one dimensional string of DNA essentially contains all the information for the protein sequence and that contains all the information for the structure and the structure essentially contains all the information about function. I talked briefly about comparing three dimensional shapes, the protein structures. And I said that structure determines function. So if function is what we are after, why don't we compare function? Why do we go through the, the sort of detour of comparing structures? Any idea? Maybe it's just that, um, that structure is um, easier to grab and identify. So the suspicion here is because we can. And that's indeed exactly the answer. Structure is easier to... to uh, we know structure relates to function and structure is easier to describe. It's a three-dimensional object for every single point. We have a coordinate point in space and we know how to compare them. Function is complex. Function, I said, this is so-called alcohol dehydrogenase uh, and for chemists that already implies some function. It breaks down a particular type of bond. It eats alcohol, so to speak. Uh, that's one aspect of the function. The other aspect of the function, however, is this molecule shown here acts as a, uh, as a homodimer. So there have to be two units that come together before it can do anything. That's another, if you want, aspect of function. It's a dimer. It's part of a particular pathway. So breaking down, it will not you know, sitting somewhere and breaking down alcohol would not work. It has to be at the right place at the right moment in order to do, accomplish this function. And this is all part of its function. And that is not, we cannot put that into a number. So we cannot compare these numbers. We can put these numbers into hierarchies, but then it's not that easy to compare these hierarchies. How do we get these shapes, the three-dimensional shapes? <coughs> do you believe? Mentioned X-ray crystallography. So that's one way in which we can do it. So by experiment, X-ray crystallography is in fact the most frequently used way in which you take the protein out of its natural environment, you put it into a state that is in which it forms crystals, and then you shoot X-rays onto these crystals. These X-ray scatter and on these crystals, and from the scattering you recompute the positions of every single atom. It takes a long time. Is very expensive. Uh, I will go back to that, uh, but just this number I'd like to be out there. Do you have any idea? So I show these, uh, these images here, and for, in this particular case I show two. How much does it cost to make an image like that? N n not me, uh, I mean I downloaded it from a database, but how do much do you believe it costs to get the data into the database for that, for one protein? Any, any idea? Throw some numbers at me. One million. That's what it took a few years ago, yes. Uh, the average price for one single image was one million. Of these images, currently we have 120,000. Okay? You have some idea how much money went in there. You have some idea how important it is to have these images. Because there's no drug that comes to the market without. I mean, the images is just a visualization, but the information behind those images is what is relevant. Today, the number is a little bit down, so the NIH, uh, of, a, of a course of 15 years, spent $1.2 billion on, in fact, reducing the price, and that succeeded. So today, most proteins will be done at, at a price of roughly $100,000, but that's still the price. Uh, now, most, so knowing three-dimensional structures or knowing something about a protein that comes close to knowing its structure, its shape, most of the ones we know are not done by experiment. They are similar to those that are done by experiment and done by computational biology. And I will come back to this uh, shortly. Uh, so they inferred, but all of that goes back. Uh, for all the others, in order to break 3D structure, we can actually not do it. We try to simplify. We try to break simplified aspects, and that will be the remainder of the lecture. So in terms of dimensionality of the problem, I briefly mentioned that, uh, and unfortunately I don't have a pointer today. So on the left-hand side, 
essentially I write strings, okay? The sequence is a string. Uh, and so there's the first string here and then there are five others, those are related sequences. And then the next string is in fact the secondary structure. You may see there's an E somewhere and there's somewhere a blank. Blank means just neither a strand nor a helix. Uh, and the E is the extended, is the arrow that you see on the right hand side. Uh, in the next column you see something that is solvent accessibility. So if you look at the structure and you imagine the structure formed a ball, then solvent accessibility is where in this ball are you? Are you in the center? Are you on the outside? All right? Which is still a single string, it's a single number. You have a certain percentage of being exposed to solvent. Now in the middle one here you see a 2D information. So there you plot on the left, uh, uh, on the horizontal and, and vertical, you, you plot the sequence and the entry here shows how close every single position in this protein is to every other position in that protein. So it's the complete distance map or the complete contact map. So distance contact, the difference is simply contact is, is sort of a binary thing. If two residues are closer than something you say they're in contact, it's the same thing. This is in fact a distance map, they can translate that to an energy map, that's a distance map. And this distance map, essentially in terms of information content, is 2D, it's not the three-dimensional structure. That's 3D, right? That's the position of every single atom or every single residue. Uh, and the information here is 2D, that's 3D, higher dimension. But the whole information is contained in the 2D image. So you can reproduce the 3D structure from this 2D information, except for you cannot distinguish between the image and its mirror. That's the only thing you lose, uh, essentially. The, now, so most of the time we will, I will talk about reducing it to that problem. But before we go there, we get into sequence comparisons. And that is essentially when you sequence a new protein, when you find uh, in human, you, you sequence uh, the people in the room here, and you, you observe there's some trait in some of them uh, that is worthwhile pursuing in a study, whatever that is, typically it's a disease. This is why for diseases we know more and this is why for many, many, many things that have been characterized for human are proteins that are somehow related to diseases. There's simply, this is the way we typically start. Uh, so typically we would look, in a, when we sequence everybody in the room, we would look for something that is common to people who have some sort of disease type trait and what is common to people who don't. And then we would possibly get to one particular gene or protein and then we would want to find out what is known about that protein. Do I know anything about it? Do I know? So the disease uh, may be something that has to do with the rush of my skin. Is that a protein that is expressed in skin cells? Or is that something where we know uh, more about it? And so the first question then is you'd search the databases. And that's the issue that I will begin to talk about today and will continue next Tuesday. Sequence comparison methods. Uh, and ultimately it asks the question how similar are two proteins. So if we had these two strings here, and if you assume these were two proteins, OPA and PAPI, then you, tr you try to see how similar they are by sort of shifting them in a way of optimizing their similarity. Now my measure for similarity for, for, for the time being is simply same letter, okay? So the mapping the P on a P, gives you one, A on A gives you one, and everything else doesn't give you anything. And you can put now, sort of bring up more sequences, now you have three, uh, in this particular case you have four, five, uh, and now there is some, some sort of thing that stands out in this example, of course, there is a meaning underneath. And this meaning underneath, some of you, most of you will recognize some of these words here. Uh, so this one is father, uh, this is, well, it's something else. Um, and then, so now what you see here is in three different languages you, you have grandfather and if you sort it, the, the, the set, then father and grandfather are sort of interfering, okay? So it's not like the grandfather words form a cluster and the father words form a cluster. In this particular case, that is not the case. Uh, in fact, this somehow uh, is what you try to do. In principle, the left-hand side 
if you had the meaning, if you wanted a comparison of the family that is such that sort of meaning is grouped together, then the left solution would be the right one. And the left solution would be the best one. Um, now, the other solution, however, the right solution, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is the one I want. That, that would be the better one. Uh, and the left solution here is defined by you optimize the identity. So up come things that are closer to each other when you look at the match score. Okay? And that match score is considered to be the objective function. This is simply what you optimize in your alignment, right? Um, and the simplest objective function is simply you count how many of these letters are identical. Uh, there are more, dis more complicated ways to describe a match. But mind you, this all completely ignores what you're after. So the match score itself, whether you count identity of, of residues or you look at something more complex and we'll get to that, it does not ask, can I group meaning? Can I group function? Can I group things together that are more similar in their structure, right? It's just we're looking at sequences. <clears throat> So, for the time being, let's just stick to that. We, have, we, are, we are comparing uh, strings. How are we going to do that? So, there are two tasks, essentially. Again, our task for the time being is we have two sequences, two 1D strings. We want to find the optimal superposition given the objective function that you want to optimize the number of identical letters. Um, so first, you need to find the optimal superposition. Well, and then you need to define optimal. Well, in this particular case, we defined optimal. Uh, but optimal, actually, even in the, in the case that I said, I defined optimal as in the percentage of identical letters. Even that is not com the complete definition. Let's look at the following example, for instance. Uh, we have two sequences that we want to compare. And under the line, you see the global solution and then there's a local best match. So the global solution requires that you take these two sequences and you align the first and the last residues and everything else you match that it is optimal. By the criterion, identity of a letter is the percentage of identical letters is the, the criterion, right? The objective function. So, but in this objective function here in the top for the global alignment, you have the constraint that you need to align the ends. While in the local, you're allowed to sort of find a locally similar region. The dots mean I have an insertion. Insertion means I essentially assume that there is sort of a hole or that one of them is longer. Okay, I'm sort of jumping, I, I gap. Uh, so the G, between the Q and the P. That would be the best local alignment. Uh, now, the interpretation of this local alignment of this, uh, sorry, of this insertion here, the, the two dots that I have, is we have an evolutionary relation, but in, you know, one example is, and this is the, the, the thing, I'm always difficult, it's always difficult for me to do that. So, assume, so one protein looks like this, and then the other protein looks like this, a, it, it sort of has a similar shape. It's just a little bit longer. I don't know whether in the back you see that. But the idea really is, you, 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 maybe I can show it with fingers. And I, uh, I just have, I have a finger, a, sh a shorter one. A sh <laughs> you get the idea. Uh, so I have an additional bump. Everything looks the same, the, an additional bump. I add something. And that something could be an additional function. It could be that it binds a little bit of a larger molecule. It could be that it buys me some a little bit more flexibility. It could be a variety of reasons. But we would assume that there is an evolutionary connection despite this addition, despite this gap that one of the two has. Um, now, it also implies this alignment. When I find the optimal solution, if it, it yes, yeah, sorry. It's a more or less a wild card. That's a very good way of, of saying it. Absolutely, it's a wild card. But the, well, so yes, the, so the yes is down. Now, in this particular case, you, the, the wild card has no cost. And this particular wild card will give you, well, like a wild card and you have only so many to give in that sense. Because you will, you will have to, when you measure 
the percentage of the identical residues do we consider the wild cards? So the wild cards are, so to speak, a price you have to somehow pay. You have, 50, I have an alignment of 100 residues and 50 are identical, and if you now had 50 wild cards in there, this is one, one meaning. If you, if you had only five wild cards in there, it would be another meaning. The wild card with a cost. Is that what you said? No, with a cost. Yes. So this is a wild card with a cost. Which typically in, the, in a wild card is not the idea. It, it, if you played cards, then it's the joker, and there's only a certain number of jokers in a, in a card deck. In that sense, it's. But yeah, it's a wild card. Um, so here's another word that I'm gonna. that, that we often refer to the word homology. Anybody in the room, any idea what that could relate to? Yes? Similar in function. Similar in function is a, is a very good word. And, uh, maybe we, I could just zip through a couple of slides. Uh, I go a little bit more in detail here. Uh, phylogeny is race, tribe, genesis, birth. Uh, and ultimately, in the, in the orange of, of species, so this is, you may have heard about this book from Darwin that was published in 1859 called The Origin, Origin of Species. This book has a many, many, many pages, many, many, many words, and one figure. That's the figure um, that shows the tree of life and essentially the idea that all life is related, this, the principle of evolution. Sorry for the, for the quality, I just don't have a better uh, way to show this. Um, today, the tree of life looks slightly different. Here are two versions, and when you look in more detail at these two different versions, you see that they somehow differ in detail. So the difference in detail is essentially, so there are bacteria, archaea bacteria, and eukaryotes, and the question is, what was the common ancestor? So is, is one of them first? Is archaea first and then prokaryotes come and eukaryotes come? Or do they sort of evolve at the same time? And these two different trees give two different answers. Back, back to homology. The homology, etymology definition, homologous, uh, homo is agreeing, same, similar. And logos is the word, reason as you most likely know. Originally, it comes from the similarity from Richard Owen, the same organ in a different animal. Uh, so, they, if, if you look at a whale uh, or different vertebrates, you see that there are parts of a whale that are not looking like hands, but they correspond to our hands and legs. So that's the homologous organ. It, it comes from a common ancestor, it has a some similar function, it's exactly what you said. Uh, now, what we today typically apply this for is on the level of genes. So when the vertebrate evolves and the whale goes, or, or some animal uh, predecessor of some sort of cow goes back into the ocean and becomes a whale, then the, 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 the thing that went into the, animal, uh, into the ocean really had four, uh, four legs. And the whale used that for something else. So it is really a one-to-one. -one. For the genes, so for the evolution of organisms and for this, the, the genes, there's not genes are not like organs, uh, is what I'm trying to say here. So it's a little bit of a stretch, but this is a, 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 exactly what people do. Uh, there is no more words here, but let's not get into them. Let's go first into this issue of speciation. So the way you create a new species. What's the definition of a new species? Any idea? A new genome. That's a very, that would be a very, very, we are not at that point yet. I believe soon, soon there will be a definition like that. But at this point, the definition that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get for just a sec um, is the one that has historically been the case before there wasn't a way to sort of compare two genomes, yeah? Hundred points. Hundred two gets you a washing machine. Yes, uh, exactly. So you you can have offsprings with a different species, but the offspring will not uh, 
produce new offsprings. Uh, the way speciation if essentially is imagined to happen uh, is in, in, in the by shown here in the following slides that come from Berkeley. Um, so you know these you have these happily mating species of, of fruit fly and they are, they are totally happy and you know they they ne next to their food and uh, at some point disaster strikes strikes right uh, there suddenly evolves a river. Uh, or the river simply there's a high flood as has been two days ago and takes the banana and puts the banana to somewhere else and on this island they're coconuts so the species of fruit flies who came to the island they loved bananas but what they all they can now ever get is coconuts I love coconuts but it's a different story uh, so they begin to be familiar with coconuts they begin to enjoy coconuts um, and then one day uh, another banana comes over and those fruit flies now will no longer have offsprings with the coconut fruit flies so that ultimately is the image in which it happens uh, so the image of a, of a river coming in between and creating two species does anybody know uh, can anybody quote an example for such a story? There really is such a story, not on the level of on, on the level of animals that are much bigger than flies, or substantially bigger than flies. Bono and chimpanzee. So the the separation between Bono and chimpanzee has exactly happened, or is assumed to have exactly happened uh, through a river. And I don't know how much you know about Bono and chimpanzee, but these two are extremely different in terms of the behavior. They are, they, they all both look somehow similar. Bonos are a little bit smaller, but they have very, very different. Uh, one is matriarch and one is a patriarch. So they, they are completely behaving differently. Um, okay, so now again, it, it, the definition is here. The idea is you have two species, you have to create a new species. This idea is a little bit oversimplified so typically you, you, you don't have just two that made and then typically you have populations but within these populations this is still the, the common idea now uh, typically we refer to the population that I show here as a breakout population so most people assume that we evolved out of Africa so the idea is that some species of human move to the north of Africa and that is a subset of all the people that existed obviously and out of this sort of local group that formed somewhere in the north of Africa, Africa some went over uh, to Eurasia uh, and so these are subsets of the entire population anyway now often the word homolog today is misused to mean we, people talk about a homologous structure so meaning it's a similar structure uh, and that's slightly over pushing but this is what you will often hear uh, and therefore although historically it may not be the right word I will, will uh, often refer to this word clearly the word homology reminds us of a connection in evolution okay back to the way of comparing sequences we're trying to get out evolutionary connections we're trying to see something about common ancestors we're trying to find homology ultimately because homology relates to some other function uh, and ultimately what we want is similarity in structure and function um, we want to compare 1d structure to find 3d similarities because in this particular case again like the story before we, we compare 3d structures because we can and if we could infer 3d similarities from 1d sequences it's not only that we can it's much much simpler much faster much easier to do uh, so the simplest way to do that is referred to as dynamic programming ultimately this is the dumbest way to do it is brute force uh, so in a visual sense you just move this thing around uh, until you have tried all possible combinations and originally was published by Niedelmann Wunsch in the 70s so again to, to show you so you have these two strings 
on the top left and then the, the move over by one you compute how well it fits, you move over by another one you compute how it fits uh, and you do that in a more formal way in which you write these two sequences into a matrix so in this particular case the first one is written on top uh, the next one is written as a column here and then you simply ask oh sorry uh, that's the first one is written on top, the next one is in a column here uh, and then you put the numbers one is simply a match, right? And then essentially what you do now is you walk along a diagonal, okay? Uh, you can move by, by exactly one on a diagonal, this is aligning two sequences, right? That's the move you, that, that you're allowed uh, and then you simply do the move, you count for every single move that you make how many hits, how many, uh, hits meaning once do you accumulate? Um, keep going, uh, there are alternative paths, in this particular case the alternative here gets higher and you see that the well value you accumulate, uh, look at the, keep looking at the wrong screen, so for the lower alignment the top you get is, is one hit, for the other one here you at least match two so you have a, a sum over one and then you sort of backtrace it and you get the optimal number of aligned things. There are two different definitions of optimal, one is with a wild card and one is without a wild card. The, the standard way is with a wild card, the right one here. Uh, in this concept of the 2D space the wild card of, uh, essentially is you move straight, right? Is there a question? Anybody? Uh, okay, so the wild card is simply move straight, so uh, as it's shown here, several wild cards. Um, now, I said the wild card has a cost. One way to call the cost is uh, to, to, to give a, um, a, a certain function, and then essentially every single wild card costs something. That is shown in this function here. So the delta ij simply is a match, is one only if i and, I and j equal one another, so if j equals i, zero else, and that would simply give you the score of the alignment, right? Um, now, when you do that for larger sequences, what I showed you before, these toy examples are short stretches, proteins are several hundred residues long typically. When you do that in larger sequences you see something like this. So you see that in fact there is a, a, a stronger line along the diagonal so there is one trace that gives you a better score. But there are others and then there are you also see in this particular uh, plot here in this so-called dot plot, up there you see a region where you have a higher density. Ultimately that means there are more possible alignments and they all give you a higher score. Uh, well, you're not seeing the sum here, but you, see, uh, you could infer that the, the relative local density there is, is higher. Um, now, if you had the cost of the wild card the way I described it, so every single wild card gives you a fixed cost, then ultimately if you had n wild cards you pay n and the price n, right? And these two examples that I show here on the left and on the right cost equally, okay? With what I showed you so far, which one do you believe is more likely biologically? Any? Yeah? The left one. The left one. Why? Because it's only one gap. So essentially, if the idea really is this, this two thing with the fingers where one is a little bit longer, you add something, then the add something, here you add, some, you, you, you add a real loop, right? Here, add something, add something, add something, you add a lot actually. This is less likely. So this is a bump here, a bump here, and then it's not that easy to make the same shape anymore. If at one point you have an additional, an embellishment, you can still, the rest can still be in the same shape. But if you have it every other way, uh, other residue, as shown in the right hand side here, then it's unlikely that you produce the same shape. And in fact, when we look at, at real alignments, 
This is the idea of blocks that comes from Steve Hanikoff, uh, shown here. This is a type of showing sequence alignments that I introduced last week, where simply f uh, one line means one protein, and where the, protein, where the lines overlap essentially implies that there these two proteins are similar. So one, two, three, four, five, six proteins, uh, seven, eight proteins shown here and I talked about domains so he would somehow see domains but the point here this is the slide that I showed you before to show you domains but here what I want to show you with this slide is that when you see these gaps they come together so it's much more likely to have one longer gap than many many shorter ones okay and this is the idea of uh, that Steve Hanikoff called blocks. So in, in real alignments, what you see sort of blocks of regions that are well aligned, and then some regions where, where it's sort of unclear, and then we begin blocks that are well aligned, which again gets back to the idea of domains. Let me just see whether there's a pointer behind here. enforce blocks in alignment? How do you do that? So uh, you're, you're, you're totally right. Uh, so what he said is you could do it by having a new function that would in fact encourage gaps to come together. How does it look, the function? You penalize the number of gaps instead of length of Yes, and this essentially is called the so-called affine gap penalty. So you pay one price for opening a gap and one price to, to extend it. And it's much cheaper to extend it, so once you have opened it, you, that creates longer gaps. So one way that I show here is when the uh, gap open is 10 times as costly as the 10 x extension or elongation, uh, you most likely will not open many gaps. Depend, again, it depends on how, you, how high you set the price. Uh, but this clearly favors, there's a very, very simple way of doing it, clearly favors to, to have longer gaps. Um, and that ultimately is shown in this formula. Then you sort of, in this particular formula here, you have the entire score uh, for doing what here is called Smith-Waterman. Uh, the original dynamic programming by Needleman Wunsch was only done for global alignments. Smith Waterman, Temple Smith uh, and Michael Waterman expanded that in 81 to coin what is today called the Smith Waterman alignment method that simply does the brute force local alignment of two sequences. Uh, because local ultimately is better, uh, global is clearly worse. Um, now, the next question really is the Total number of matches, the best criterion. Protein domains are 400, uh, 60 to 400 residues long. Uh, so clearly, what, what I, where I'm heading here, uh, there are two different things. So one is, yes, we know that we have to compare on the level of domains. But there is a little bit more to it. How local do you have to go? And that brings me back to this slide here. Uh, we have two different solutions. One is I, in fact, align only two residues, GQ, shown in this uh, box there, right? And if I do only GQ, so I only align two residues, then I get 100% sequence identity. I could also align the whole thing and I get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven residues aligned, four and seven right. So that's not 100%. It's much longer. Instead of two, I align seven. So which one is better? So four and seven, long, less similar, or two and two. Um, and well, one issue, of course, is the gap number here that is important, so it brings in the, the, the gap penalty. Um, but ultimately, how could you decide which of these two is better? 
after the gap penalty is, is uh, reduced from it. Again, the gap penalty doesn't help you really, but it's clearly, two and two is clearly a higher number than four and seven. Is it really better? How could you decide that? Any idea? Why the first is in two and the second is in seven? Where is no, so sorry. Uh, when you look, so this is the, the, the first alignment. Uh, so when I align these two sequences, one is up there, one is here. When I align these two sequences, I, a local alignment means I can break the alignment. So I can just, instead of aligning the whole thing, that would be a global sequence, a uh, global alignment, I just align some local regions. And there are I look at two particular examples for local regions. One shown in green, where I just align, align two residues. And for two residues, I get 100% sequence identity. And the other one I show here in purple, in the purple uh, square, is when I align seven residues, the best alignment that I find for seven is four and seven right. And these two alignments are shown here. So the second one is the four and seven, and the first one is the two and two. The question is, how can I decide which one is better? Another follow-up question to this, uh, maybe I should pick this up in the earlier lecture, but these residues, uh, are they referring to amino acids? I'm sorry for that. Uh, my mistake. Yes, residues. So, I mean, so the proteins are made up of 20 different amino acids. The moment we put them together in, in a protein, we talk about residues. I'm sorry for, for the lingo. Uh, this is the one thing that I should change in my letter, but I can't. It's just, I'm so used to the residues. Sorry for that. Yes, residues are amino acids. I'm sorry. Thank you. There are many in the room who don't, know, don't remember that. Thanks. Yes? One more question just to clarify. I mean, we're looking at it and we're seeing only three matches. So where did the fourth come? There's one G, Q, and uh, He says I made a mistake in counting. One, two, three. Yes. <coughs> uh, I believe the dot is at the wrong place. That's a very good point. Uh, I'm sorry. So, take my example and switch the dot uh, so that the E matches on the E. So this indeed is only 3 and 7. Absolutely right. Sorry for that. Uh, so, either you switch it mentally or from now on I talk about 3 and 7. Uh, there was another question or? Uh, no, for the answer, it's a long shot. You can uh, compare the probability of the actual how do you, so the <clears throat> answer here is, we can, and the answer goes exactly in the right directions. I'm, I'm still lacking a little bit of detail. Uh, we can pro compare the probabilities. How would I get a probability for that? Is it entropy? Entropy is what you said? Yeah. Is it entropy? Now, entropy is a fancy word, probability is a fancy word, and I would call them both on the, on the same level. Uh, entropy, schmentropy, probability, uh, it's all the same thing. Uh, the question is, how do I compile it? Okay? Yes, entropy, in fact, is in many ways a more, more reasonable uh, measure to use here. Um, but again, how could I compile it? If you're claiming two, two is better than four and seven. No, I'm not claiming. I'm asking you what I have to do in order to get, claim any of the two. But if we think that the first one is better, maybe we just divide and compare the ratios. Ah, but that, that's the point. So two and two is 100. Three and seven or four and seven, whichever, whichever version. Let me keep using four and seven. Uh, so four and seven is a smaller number. Is that the end of the story? So, uh, that cannot be the end of the story. First of all, the way I ask, you know it's not the end of the story. And secondly, <clears throat> that would get me to one, re one residue. And I would always get one that is identical. And that's nonsense. And that brings up the, word of, the words entropy and probability. We need to look at something else. Um, I mean, if you assume that you know nothing about the sequences, you could probably just uh, and you say all the amino acids appear with um, the same probability in nature, and um, it's probably much more likely to get a sequence of two, the M by, by randomness, on other than a sequence of four. Okay, so the, um, uh, what he says is, 
when, when most likely, if I simply look at the probability, let's just assume every amino acid is, we have 20 amino acids and they're equally likely, so for matching any two is the square of 1 over 20. So there's a certain background hit probability, right? And to hit two residues uh, that are identical in a long string is, is much easier, maybe, or might be much easier, than to hit four and seven. And that again is exactly the idea of entropy or probability. True. So how are we going to compile that? I, again, the question continues to be, is it? Is 4 and 7, is the probability? So you said, my, my intuitive feeling is 2 and 2 is, is easier. And your intuitive feeling is absolutely right. But how can we put some sort of idea in you know, how to test it? So begin with the hypothesis. Intuitive feeling, I have the impression. But how then do you nail whether that hypothesis is right? That's the scientific procedure. The beginning of the hypothesis, science starts with an intuition very often. But then comes the process. Nail it. How? Compare it with real world data and see if, um, if, um, the, if you find enough of these matches in real world data that you can assume that, it's, that your hypothesis. So he, he says we could compare yourself to real world data. That is correct. What is real world data? What would you take? Yeah? Perfect example. So I take the proteins of known structure, or even simpler, I take the proteins in human, or I take uh, all known proteins. So they're, they're different databases. In fact, I take all, all known proteins, 85 million, on average at least 500 residues long, you sort of get an idea how probable, how easy it is to have any pair of two amino acids observe uh, in a random string. So, um, yes, so you simply compile probability, entropy, expectation values for a background distribution from real data. The problem with that, of course, is this take, may take a while to, to run the entire database and compute the background probabilities, but it will bring up the, the answer in this particular case that 4 and 7 most likely depends a little bit on which 4 the, in this particular, in, in any case, 4 and 7 is, is certainly much, much more useful. Now this also gets us into another criterion. Is identity the best way of doing it? So, in the, so far I, I talked about the match of one letter, an identical letter gives you a one, a non-identical letter gives you a zero. Uh, can you think about something else to do from what I told you, yes? Take the length of the string into account. The length of the residue, that's a great idea. So I talked about side chains and I said that some side chains are longer. Uh, so the idea now would be I could sort of compare side chains and I could classify side chains according to their size. And the next idea would be not only according to their size but according to some of the biophysical features. There are positively charged residues, there are negatively charged residues, uh, and most likely if I had a particular case in a protein shown in this particular example here, uh, in for this particular protein, what happens to be a potassium channel, so a protein in the membrane that lets potassium pass, uh, and it's very selective. It only lets potassium pass. Uh, and the selectivity, or the, and in fact, this is one of those simple figures that ultimately led to a Nobel Prize because the guy who got the, uh, McKinnon got the Nobel Prize on the structure for the potassium channel. He had the intuition to in fact highlight those, four, those three residues that are here in yellow to see that those would be the selectivity. Those would be the ones that most likely uh, would decide whether the potassium is passed or, or something else. Uh, and you see that in this, for these particular three, only for one of them in the middle here. So what you have, um, I cannot see my mouse. No, this one I cannot see my mouse. Uh, so it says query 21. So there, there are two sequences written where, where the yellow box is. One is above there is an A and below an I and then there is an E and an E. So E and E is the only one where the letter is really identical. The other two yellow boxes 
mark letters that are not identical between the two. And yet, this is the signal for the selectivity of the potassium channel. So those are two different proteins, in, in fact, two different kingdoms, two different species, and they do the same thing. Uh, so this already is, is one way of, of showing that identity is not really it. We need to look at biophysical features, length of side chain was a great idea, uh, and put this into a matrix that has a slightly different way of scoring. How could you sort of come up with a way of doing that? Well, one way would be you compute the energy. So you compute the physical, biophysical features. It's not that simple. Another way in which you could do that, and that's the way ultimately that the Hennikov, Stephen and Jorge Hennikov did it, uh, Sean, there's only Stephen here, because this, they, I have to defend myself, there's no photo of Jorge available. Uh, so they, they started manually to align proteins, just look at them and see what makes sense. They are, they are experts. Um, as you can see, that he has, uh, Stephen has a pipette. Uh, so he, he's doing experimental biology. This is what experimental biologists do the whole day. Um, it really is actually true. <laughs> um, and then once you have the things aligned that you, you believe are matching, <coughs> you can compile, uh, compile a simple log odds ratio. Uh, that log odds ratio translates to a scoring matrix. The scoring matrix is such that for particular, so on the diagonal you have uh, identical match, right? And you may see for the diagonal that the numbers are not all the same. Because for some residues, like matching an E on E gives you a 4, uh, and matching, for instance, uh, a, a G, uh, an A on an A is only a 2. So, it's not the same whether you have an A or E match, simply because of the background probability. So it's not only the background probability for two, better, two and two better than four and seven, but also which types of residues do you match. Some are more important to match than others, or bring you more. Um, there are many, many more of these, what is called, yes? Uh, could you please go back to the matrix? Uh, so I noticed the negative numbers here. What do they exactly mean? So this is, again, now the way you normalize the matrix, so in terms of log odds ratio, much less than expected by chance. Okay? So this is a hit that is unlikely to happen as discouraged, right? Now when you put that into the alignment method that I showed you into the Smith-Waterman, then that would, so you would pay a price, a penalty score, but aligning two things that are having a minus score here would also be a penalty. So you would gain more, sometimes locally you would, you would pay a penalty if then at the end of the day you would align things like the Y and the tryptophan, the W here in the end that has 17. So to, to catch another tryptophan, right, you would then accept some negative scores in the middle. Yeah? I don't fully understand the meaning of the matrix. Uh, you highlight the cross-section of I and A does it mean that this is a score for observing A after I? Or no, this is so. Uh, thank you very much. So the question is what I hi highlight in this particular one is I and A. The minus one number here is the one that matches I and A. And the meaning of it is what do I get? So previously in our Smith Waterman score, I had a delta IJ function. And the delta IJ was one if J equals I and zero else. Now I replace the delta ij with the entry that I sh that I highlight here. If I match an i and a j, and, and, and sorry, an i and an a in this particular case here, then the delta ij, the return of that function is minus one. If I matched uh, an a on an a, that's the red one here, the, the function returns a two. Uh, here for the L, uh, for the M, L and M, it returns a 4. Uh, and the 4 is actually the same that I get for doing E on E. Those are a couple of things that I highlight. Is, is this matrix clear? But diagonal should be always higher than M here. 
No, it is not. So this is exactly the point that I'm highlighting here. Uh, so the question was, is the diagonal always higher than anything below the diagonal? Not necessarily. Again, this is compiled by a log odds matrix. Uh, let me get into the formula again. You simply, ultimately, this is the entropy idea here. This is like an entropy. So you essentially compute how often you see a particular pair I and A or I and, and whatever uh, and what would you have expected by chance. That's the, the, the idea that we evolved here. Uh, that gives you the, the, the ratio and that ratio is actually plotted. Now the ratio you may intuitively expect that the diagonal so matching identity is always highest uh, but I highlighted in this particular matrix a point here the M on L is 4 and the E on E is 4. So the diagonal here is not higher than something that is off the diagonal. May I clarify a question? Ah. The uh, diagonal for any particular like, character is always higher than anything below that particular character's diagonal. Like, if you have like 4 for E, anything below this particular 4 should be lower, right? It's always more likely to match E to E than E to something else. Now this is something uh, thank you very much. So what he says, uh, I misunderstood the question. The diagonals are not always the higher numbers, I said. True. But the question was, within one column, the diagonal should be the highest. And that indeed is true. Because within, so, uh, my, yes, E on E is not as important as L on M. But in the E column, there's nothing higher than matching E on E. That's the statement, yes. And I'm, I'm not entirely, so this, to me, uh, I never asked myself that question. Uh, in the matrix, it seems that way. Or does anybody see an exception? I'm not, so there's nothing that enforces that. So they, nothing is written in the math that enforces this. Um, I would have to think about it a little bit. I have to think about this. Well, obviously, the matrix does. Uh, the matrix obviously says not, uh, but I still have to think about this a little bit. Yes. Uh, Just, ah, sorry. There. I, I, yes. Let's begin with you first. I, I had met the one behind. I mean, this property that the, the element on the diagonal is always greater. It, it might depend on the. The way you build your scoring matrix, the function that you use to, 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 to get the numbers for the matrix. That is, that is true. So again, uh, so what he said is, it depends on essentially the, the objective I have and the way I define my scoring matrix. It could be different. Uh, here, I use it from the from uh, expert align, alignments. So I take it from expert observations from experts and the question then is would it make could I imagine a reason a biophysical region why it would make sense and again this is something that I have to think about there's another question yeah I, it might be a silly question but I do have a, a little problem with understanding when you're talking about matching what does matching mean oh. I mean this point is going to say match A matches I or something like that those, those are two different levels so does matching mean and I'm sorry. So the uh, <clears throat> the question here is, what do I precisely mean by the word matching? And I did not give the definition. So in this context here, um, I used two different definitions of it. So I switched my definition. At some point this morning, I used the word matching to mean delta i delta i j function where j equals i. So matching means one. I have used that term. And then I have used the term meaning I match the A and the V. So I superpose two residues and I say those are the corresponding, so the G corresponds to the G, the Q to a Q, the P to an L. And I call that a matching position. And so I have changed the, the, the way I use my definition and I'm sorry for that. Uh, so the entry to the matrix here, in this entry to the matrix, the entry is simply a superposition of the P to the L, or in this particular case here, of the G to the G, the E to the E, and the M to the L. And the matrix is symmetric. Yes? Um, it's a question about it. So, 
can be that the matching is more expensive to extend again, right? Yes. And so if so doing the minus seven, it could be better to like extend the gap just for like three or four, just have a better match. Ah, so ah, ah, ah. Um, Oh, that's an interesting one. Yes, so the point here is some of these numbers appear to be very, very negative, very high numbers here. We get to the minus eight. I can't remember what the highest number is. Uh, it may be the minus eight. Um, so if I pay that much of a price to, to, to match or to, to uh, overlay these two particular amino acids, these particular two residues, why not insert a gap? And that ultimately depends on the gap penalty. Uh, so, let's leave it there. That could happen, yes. Uh, today there are many, many substitution matrices, but by the way, the, way, the one uh, that I just showed you is the so-called Blossom 62. It's not because it was done in 1962, but it was done those are the kinds of things you don't really don't need to know. I still want to say it. Uh, so when experts did the alignment, they included everything that has 60% sequence identity to each other. Okay? That's just the expert set was confined by having a minimal percentage sequence identity between any pair. Otherwise, they didn't align them. That was 62. And everything else, the expert aligned. And that's why it's called 62. Yes? So Yes. The percentage sequence identity between the sequences that have been used in order to build the expert data set that has been used to compile the log odds. And there's a Blossom 30, where then obviously 30% is the set to produce this, another expert set for which this is compiled. Yes? Matters. So, so we are what is the last word? The order of the sequence? Matters. Matters, yeah. Uh, so, the question is could it be that the number of the diagonal is always the highest because, of the, because there is a reason for the way the sequence runs? It runs from one end happens to be called ends, end terminus to the other end, which is, happens to the end of the protein. The last residue is called the C terminus, according to the chem biochemistry. But anyway, could that, so statement number one, the directionality seems to be relevant. So we do see that, that proteins are inverted and they actually also function because the gene is read the other way around uh, and translated the other way around. And some of that works. And in some cases it doesn't. And clearly, the directionality has important function. That's true. Uh, now, that most likely, however, will not affect the diagonal because the, the, the directionality, so the, the, the function that I showed you, the Blossom 62 matrix, is forced to, buy, uh, to be uh, symmetric. So the symmetry is there. And if, the, if it would be because of the order, then it would not be symmetric. So the, 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 you would, that would affect the asymmetry. But the authors, the Helikovs, argued when they see asymmetry, then more likely that is an issue in the database than anything else. So they therefore sort of artificially uh, made sure that the, the matrix is symmetric. They postulated the matrix to be symmetric. Uh, but no, the, 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 we, we, what you, what you, the effect that you suspect is relevant is relevant, but not for this story. Okay. Um, Again, there are many, many different matrices. There are here, Francisco Melo has an interactive tool to play around uh, with alignment tools, which is interesting to use. Um, and that just a sec, that brings us also to this issue that the way you choose gap penalties is not that simple. And in different families is, is done differently and it will get more complicated next lecture. Yes? Just out of curiosity, is a high score in the Blossom matrix maybe related to like similar functionality or molecular whatever structure? Um, so <laughs> this is the so the, the, let me repeat the question for those of you who didn't hear it. Down here, you may observe there are numbers 
1710. Uh, there up there is the C or 12. And then in between here, the N has a 2 on the diagonal. So some of these amino acids you come away with are much less important to, map, to, 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 to match to each other. Again, sorry for, for the swap of the definition again. Uh, to superpose A and A is much less important, or to superpose N and N is much less important than to, super, to have C and C. Uh, let, me, let me keep saying match in, in two different senses. Um, so now the question is, is this because the ones with a higher number, the Y and the, trip, the W and the C, are functionally more important? And yes, that's exactly what people would argue. This is exactly, you, you, you ask uh, many people in the field, in particular uh, in the field, and many people will answer, the answer is this is true. More strictly speaking, what the high numbers has to do with what you see in the database. What you see in the database has to do with the numbers. The numbers sometimes, so the highest numbers here, in fact, are more rare amino acids. True. So, trip to W and Y are the rarest. C is, is also not that common. It's not the next rarest. Uh, but now I give you two explanations and both sort of explain the same tendency. And I believe it's a little bit of both. Okay? Now, you could go to the next one. Well, maybe they are rare because they're functionally important. I believe that goes the wrong direction, but I'm not entirely sure. Yes? The question was more a little bit different. Is there a score to, to compare for functional similarity? <coughs> Does that correlate actually with... So could I have... I say there are many different scoring matrices. I want to compare sequences in order to find out that they have a similar function. Why not? optimize the scoring matrix such that it got just gets exactly that answer right. That's highly non-trivial. Well, let me define it more clearly. This is impossible. This has failed. Uh, it has failed over and over again in the hundreds of publications that show how it fails. Uh, they don't all say that they fail, but uh, it is relatively easy to do that for structure. So if your objective would be to find the similarity in structure. That you can easily measure and that you can do and there are a couple of different schemes that do this. Uh, you, you could do that. Uh, now, unfortunately those for structure are not completely reproducing the kind of things people want, want for function. Uh, there are many, many, many different uh, matrices. Ultimately, these few are used not because they are blossom matrices are around for many years, not necessarily because they are better, uh, but because none of those that are, that are different really make a big difference. And then what I'm saying here, I, I will tell you something else in passing too. Uh, let's keep it there. Identity is not necessarily reflecting meaning just like with father and, uh, and opa or something like that, or grandfather, the, the different, let's call it substitution matrices or ways of uh, scoring a, a fit or an overlap between two uh, residues or two letters is more reasonable in terms of biology. Now, dynamic programming produces the optimal solution given an objective function. But there are two, two issues. Um, so the first one here is the time used for the algorithm. Uh, this is in the order of the length squared, right? So you have two proteins of uh, one of length n and one of length m, so it's n times m. The algorithm works on, a, on an order of, of n times m, and that's the fastest way in which you can do it. Now, you may argue proteins are sort of 400 residues or 1,000 residues long, uh, comparing two proteins, ah, come on, with modern computers, a few thousand times a few thousand, you can easily do that, no? Why should that be a problem? Why should I care? So I don't want to do an alignment on my, on my, my watch, so why should I care? Yeah? Now about comparing sequences with real-world data, 
and there's probably a lack of that, so we have to do this over and over. Okay, so uh, the 85 million are in the database. Uh, so one against 85 million, that is already slightly different when I now have the uh, square effect. And let me just show you an example for, for the type of problem that we run into and I, I map it to something that happened to us in our group when we came to Germany in uh, 2009. About 8 million sequences were known, protein sequences. Uh, when I did the slide here, 2014, the number had risen to 55, which implies about a seven-fold increase over 55 months, so essentially double every two years. A little bit faster than computers over that same period of time. Uh, CPU didn't grow that fast. Uh, and now we get into the comparison issue, right? Uh, the number of all, if I had to do an all against all uh, in 2009, 64 by the 12, uh, as opposed to 14, much, much larger. And there actually we have a 20 fold increase every two years. And that, as you can all see, really, really, really is a challenge. By the way, in terms of data storage, so we moved from, from storing five terabytes when we moved here. We actually really carried it from Manhattan uh, with hard disks to something in 2014, we had 300 terabyte compressed, uh, compressed data. And in 2014, so now this thing is even bigger, so, so handling uh, 300 terabyte in 2014 was much, much, much tougher than handling to the, in 2009-5. That ultimately is the, is the issue. Uh, so there are many, many, many issues. Uh, but ultimately here, the point is that yes, dynamic programming gives the best solution. And yes, so doing it for one protein may still, one against 85 may still work, but all against all, this totally doesn't work anymore. So that's one problem. Uh, another problem is that we don't have an in, a, a simple way to define these free parameters. There's the gap open, there's the back gap allocation, there's the type of substitution matrix. And all of these have to be taken into relation to each other. As somebody already correctly observed, if the substitution matrix has more negative values, then the gap penalty has to be changed or adjusted. Uh, that is complicated to do. So, in fact, there is, again, you could argue that you want to optimize that for function. Uh, but the type of function, actually, whether you want to align an enzyme or an actin, a muscle fiber protein, gives you a different answer. That ultimately is the reason why, why this idea is not as easy as it sounds. So, that brings us to the question, how can we speed it up? Can you think about a method to do the same thing? So, you want to compare two strings. Um, but in a way that is much faster than what I showed you so fast. Much faster than brute force. Any idea? What you could do? Yeah? I'm not sure what to do, but it should be something approximate. You have to do something that is no longer the com com completely. So you have to approximate. You have to do something that is empirical. Yes, that's clearly true. Some statistical things. Or Some uh, statistical things. Yes, but how? <laughs> Any idea? Maybe you can build some search index with some um, commonly uh, identified, commonly appearing um, domains or something like that. Oh, that's a great idea. Uh, so the idea here was, uh, unfortunately, this is this in, in, this is in fact also what people have done. Uh, but the, the, so the idea is the following: you simply look. I talked about the Blossom 62 was done on a set of proteins for which some expert alignments existed. So let's look at those and see whether there are sort of some common let's call them motives or motifs or, or, or sort of local things that you see over and over and over again. Okay? Something that is coming. Put them into a database. Let's call them, I don't know what, motives or let's call them anchors or let's, let's call them signatures. So we build up a database of signatures and then we simply go through this set of signatures first. That's a great idea. Um, and in many ways, so there is a database of such signatures that are related to really clear functional signals, and people would go through that. That is one way of doing it. Uh, along those lines, something that is requiring less expertise, is that 
You want to say something? Yeah. A star? True, so you're right. Uh, let's, let's get back to the motif idea. Um, so we, 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 we could have... Uh, is, is, what's the simplest thing you can do? That, that, uh, yeah? So, uh, first of all, I want to clarify if I understood the question right. You're trying to find a method that would, you know, the, that would speed up the, the, the comparison in, in, in between different residents. Is that it? Why don't you just do the international? Yeah, this is the way science goes. I don't know whether everybody in the room heard him. Uh, why don't I mean I don't I don't get your question. Why don't you just do hashing? Yes, that's exactly the solution. Uh, and very very often, simple solutions are for you. It may have appeared very simple, uh, but the definition of a simple solution is once you have seen it, you don't you, you don't understand why you haven't seen it from the start. That's one definition of a, of a simple solution. Uh, so essentially what you do is you begin with a word, let's call it word. So you for instance begin with a, in this particular case I show a threemer. So you take three consecutive letters. So underlined in red up to the left is tick, T-Y-K. Okay? So you take this threemer, scan it through. Now it's easy to hash this. You can do that super fast. Uh, and then you say, well, okay, in this particular case here, uh, in this algorithm that does it, it's called BLAST, uh, that originally started with the word size indeed of three, that was called seeds. So for the comparison of these two sequences, here you have five seeds. You have five of these three mirrors that match. Now what's the next step? I mean, this is through hashing you can do it in a very, very fast way. What's the next step? Yes? How do you compute that? How do you compute? How do you calculate the seeds? Like it's a big protein sequence. So you have to compare. Every three mer. You move three mers through. Okay, and you compare when it goes with the whole corpus of the. Well, every so let's, let's begin with a so uh, you, you take the TTY in this particular case we would have a map too uh, so my example is not chosen very well uh, but you will not have overlapping matches so what I show here would assume I have to change my my slide what I what I show is assuming that YKL is the first match. Okay, overlapping matches you don't allow, and then you simply take whatever is the next one. You move, you, you move your register by one, and try the next one until you find one. And when you, have, you, you find, uh, so here in the middle, the, in fact, E, K, V, uh, K, Q, Y, and you also begin to see another effect in my slide. Uh, they are not identical. Because ultimately the match score, or the again, sorry for, for changing match again, uh, but what is underlined in red is not really completely identical words, identical in the sense of a blossom matrix. So it's above some threshold if you compute the, the blossom matrix for the consecutive three. Okay? But then you, you sort of slide it through and you try all, all these three maps, and you can do that extremely rapidly. To create the map of, of red is easy. Now the question is, what is the next step? Yes. You do that again. You, you, could, we, we, you do it again, but so we would get the same thing. So I assume that essentially my, this is not true in my in my example, but my assumption here is that all the seeds you find in this particular case were five, and it, with an absolutely clear match. There, there are two. I, yeah. We can cluster. Oh. Uh, My question is something else. Um, so there was another, yeah? 
maybe you then break that down and arrive at better simplicity. No, but that's exactly what, I believe that's also what she says. So you, you're both somehow in some sense clustering, you break it down. What I mean is, say in your first fast word matching, the solution, the, I really have to change my example there to make it simpler to see, but the only words you find of three are the, the, the five red underlined ones. Uh, and say I assume that this is not the best I can do in terms of alignment. I have to go another step. I have to refine from there. And how can I do that? You could make the word longer. Yes, that's true. And, uh, <clears throat> but if you made the length of the word longer, <clears throat> so scan number one, you take three. Scan number two, you take five, for instance. But if you did that, then actually it's the same time whether you start with five or you redo the five, right? There's nothing you gain from three, yeah? You can use this to pre-select a, a set of similar um, So, uh, well, um, so now you, you uh, most people have not heard what you said, and that's good because you, you're sort of, what you suggest, the second step of what you suggest skips a couple of slides. Uh, but, um, Let's, let's look at the first step of what he said. He said we could select the uh, uh, red lines here. In fact, that's why they are called seeds. Uh, they begin something. And what they begin is an extension, uh, shown here. So the simplest way of extending is you simply try to see whether the next one you align in, bi in both directions from the seed. You go left and right from the seed and see whether what you add brings you a positive value in terms of a blossom matrix or an identity matrix, delta IJ or whatever it is. Uh, the next step then would be you do a real dynamic programming. So you go in the sequence neighborhood, meaning again you start with the seeds, there are these two seeds, and you begin from there on, take them as, as the beginning and then begin dynamic programming in both directions. Okay. Now, in between, uh, ultimately, you do not know how to align. That is really something where we will say, in this particular case, you would argue, what I have here is three local alignments. Whether it means that there are three different domains and everything else in between I cannot align, or whether it means something else I cannot say, but what I find with this method is really three strong local hits. Um, now, strong local hits, my problem in the whole thing now really becomes statistics. Because what I consider, we are back to the story that two identical is very easy to find. And we have letter length of three. So we have to be a little bit careful that we're not sh really beginning from trivial hits. Okay, when we extend, that goes a little bit away, but still, Statistics here is a very, very important background. And statistics essentially is we need a distribution of what is a random hit. And this is back to what we had before. The blue is the background. And in, in this particular case, we can in fact even simulate the background. So ultimately from the idea that you mentioned before, uh, oh, uh, I'm out of time. Uh, you mentioned before, we can somehow compute the, the background score and then the hits are shown in red here, so that's the actual score of these three regions that I showed you in the previous slide. And then ultimately the, the difference between the red and the median here of the blue is how informative the score is, how much entropy is contained in that, what's the probability uh, of this score. So again, the value of the score depends on how far away from the blue it is, and it depends on how the blue is shaped. So if you have a wider distribution, then the significance is less of the same, at the same distance to the median. And this is the point where I will recommence next Tuesday. Thank you for your attention.